story. Our good American lady's recording. She is perfect. If the story that I'm going to tell you is a spoiler, then for that, I apologize greatly. I want to tell you about two men. One is called James and another one is called Khan. So there's James and there's Khan. Now, James is a smart guy. He's clever. He's very good at solving problems, but he always solves problems his own way. And then there's Khan. Khan is a bit of a maniac, crazy guy. He's dangerous. He's willing to do anything to get what he wants. And I mean, anything. The two of them haven't seen each other for years and they cross paths. And all of a sudden, there's no good reunion here. There is great conflict. They battle with each other. And it doesn't matter what James tries. He just can't defeat Khan. Khan seems to be one step ahead of him all the way. Well, this story between these two men builds to a crescendo. And as the story nears its end, it seems that James and everyone he loves is doomed. It seems that Khan has found a way to win once and for all. And the danger with this man is if he gets his way and defeats James, then he could go to do what he's wanted to do before, which is enslave all people. But you know what? In this story, there's an advocate, an ambassador, and there is one who fights for James, and his name is Suchen. Now, Suchen is quite hard to say. In fact, when we first ever meet him, he doesn't tell people to call him Suchen because he says, my name is unpronounceable to, he to humans. Suchen steps in just at the perfect moment when literally everything is going to explode. He steps in and he saves James, he saves everyone else, and he sacrifices himself in order to rescue everyone from Khan. Suchen dies. And some of the last words he says before he dies, he says, one life is given for many and the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Do you know that story? What's that story, Neil? Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. If you've never watched it, then I, I would apologize for spoiling it for you, but it came out in 1982. So I feel like you've had your chance to have a spoiler-free life. And if you haven't watched The Wrath of Khan, honestly, where, where have you been? What you need to understand about Star Trek is the even-numbered ones are good, and the odd-numbered ones are just stepping stones to get to the good ones. Because, you know, I've saved you two hours if you haven't seen that film, but Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, is the battle between James T. Kirk and um, Khan, who was a genetically engineered human who wanted to take over the universe. It's an interesting story. A story of love, a story of true sacrifice. And bits of that story represent elements of the gospel story. Now, I don't know what you all read or what you all watch, but the truth is, culture, storytelling, and people are often quite obsessed with rescue stories. Now, if you like modern rescue stories and you've got good taste, obviously you'll watch the Marvel films um, that have endless superhero quests where somebody comes in and saves the day. And apologies, spoilers again, Iron Man dies to save the universe, clicks his finger and stops. Um, what's his name? I've forgotten his name. Thanos, thank you, sir. Thanos, he stops Thanos, but he sacrifices himself. We see bits of the gospel story coming out time and time again in books, in films, sometimes even in songs. It is there because there is something in us, in who we've been made to be, which appreciates and values these pictures of rescues and help us to recognize that we know that we live in an imperfect, broken world. Well, 
if I'm spoiling Star Trek 2, I might as well spoil, spoil Star Trek 3 because it's an odd-numbered one. And the only reason it's there is to get you to number four, where they go back to uh, San Francisco in the 1980s and rescue whales. It's really good. In Star Trek 3, Spock comes back to life. Shh, don't tell anyone. Um, and, and where have we heard that story before? Oh, on the third day, as we've sung, as we've recognized, Jesus was raised to life. So these stories, these images in culture represent something which connects to us on a fundamental level, that we know that there's a need in us, that there is a gospel story, which we know as Christians has brought us from a place where we were without hope, where we had no rescuer, but one came and his name was Jesus. Now ask, our gospel pass, sorry, our scripture passage this morning brings us one of Paul's summaries of the gospel. Um, I'm going to read it to you. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Now, as, as I read this, it isn't the whole gospel. And the purpose of it isn't really that it tells the gospel in a summary. Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church about their responsibility as people of this gospel. So it says this, let me remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I preached to you when we first met. This is the essential message that you have taken to heart, the central story that you now base your life on. And through this gospel, you are liberated, unless, of course, your faith has come to nothing. For I passed down to you the crux of it all, and I received this from others. This is that the anointed one, Jesus, the liberating king, he died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. And all of that happened to fulfill the scriptures. It was the perfect climax to God's covenant story. After his return, he appeared alive to Cephas. You might know him as Simon Peter. And then to the rest of the 12. And if that was not amazing enough, on one occasion, he appeared to more than 500 believers at one time. Now, many of those brothers and sisters, they're still around to tell the story, although some have fallen asleep in Jesus. Soon. He appeared to James, his brother, who was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And then he appeared to the rest of the emissaries that he himself had commissioned. Last of all, he appeared to me. I was like a child snatched from his mother's womb. You see, I am the least of all his emissaries. I'm not fit to be called his emissary because I hunted down and I persecuted the church. But today, I am who I am because of God's grace. And I have made sure that the grace he offered me has not been wasted. I've worked harder, longer, and smarter than all the rest. But I realize it is not me. It is God's grace with me that has made the difference. In the end, it doesn't matter whether it was I or the other witnesses who brought you this message, what matters is that we keep preaching and that you have faith in this message. So that's our scripture. Just the first 11 verses of the penultimate chapter of 1 Corinthians. So Paul this morning in this scripture is calling us to consider our engagement with the gospel. He outlines it briefly to the Corinthians. He tells them that this was what Jesus did. And what's the purpose of that? Well, at the beginning in verse two, he says to them, first of all, this is the essential message. It is the essential message, the life-changing message, the world-changing message. And more than that still, this is the essential message that you've taken to heart. And that means that that message is the source of God making his home with you by salvation. Now, I'm going to think about messages and the essential nature. When Paul says 
that this gospel is the essential message. He's telling us that it's central to our lives. It's the epicenter of who we are. Now, we know what an epicenter is, don't we? Because we generally hear the word epicenter used when we think of earthquakes or perhaps sometimes nowadays pandemics. But if we think about earthquake, we know what the epicenter is because it's listed as the place with the strongest impact. You know, uh, we don't have many earthquakes, do we, in the UK? I mean, a few years ago, there was one in Birmingham. It measured four on the Richter scale, and it did, I think, three million pounds worth of improvements to the city centre. Um, anyway, sorry, I shouldn't make jokes about Birmingham because I, I used to live near there. But um, the epicentre, the higher the number on the earthquake scale, the greater. When we hear not in the UK, when we hear in the world of an earthquake that was an eight or a nine, we know with worry in our hearts, the devastating impact that it can have. Eights and nines on the Richter scale destroy cities, don't they? Look at the tsunami on Boxing Day that we remember that devastated a continent um, coastline. Big, powerful earthquakes radiate out from an epicenter and rearrange life. Whereas when we see them in the UK, we often go, there was an earthquake and it was a two, and we go, the cupboard rumbled. It's a big difference, isn't there, on that scale? I want to ask you a question. If we relate our faith to the scale of magnitude of an earthquake, if a reporter came in and said, I want to do a report on your Christian faith, on a scale of one to 10, what's your Richter impact? What an interesting question that would be. If the reporter said to you, tell me, Bernice, what is your Richter impact for Jesus? And tell me about what it's like to be a four or a nine or a two or a six. Think about that. What is the Richter scale impact of your Christian faith? Not what was it? Because, you know, we can't live in the past. We shouldn't live in the past. Tomorrow and yesterday are irrelevant. It's today, isn't it? What are we doing that's of an impact for the Lord now? Is our impact barely noticeable? Is it sizable? Is it world changing? That's an important thing to think about for what Paul is sharing. I want to think about um, a seesaw with you. Using a few images today. You know what a seesaw is, don't you? You know that? You, it, it pivots in the middle. You sit on one end and it goes up and down. Some of you might have played. I say that because not everybody necessarily has been on a seesaw, but I'm assuming most of us know seesaw like that, Marjorie Daw. Anyway, um, seesaws pivot in the middle. The middle is neutral, isn't it? It's the balancing point. If you go a little bit to the left or to the right, it moves port or starboard. One of the um, things I want to say that to you about the seesaw, um, I want to say that in our lives, most of the time, we are tipping one way or another about issues or things. We are very passionate about something, tips a lot this way. We are very much, look, who's neutral about Marmite in this room? Who loves Marmite, anybody? Who would honestly rather lick a cat than, than, than yeah, there you go. It's fine, it's true. Even Marmite know it, don't they? That's how they advertise it. Most of the things in our lives are either very positive or very neutral. We are rarely neutral. In fact, people talk about neutral like the Swiss. Let's be honest, the Swiss aren't neutral. They're just, they're just rich enough just not to engage with us. That's the reality of Switzerland. Um, I think our tendency to swing one way or another is part of the brokenness of our humanity because of sin. We're either in with both feet or we're out with both feet. We are rarely neutral. You know, if we like something, 
let's think about this positive side of the scale. If we're interested in something, it tends to move along a scale that I'm going to suggest to you. If you go past neutral and you see something interesting, you move a step to this side. And if that's good, you probably go, yeah, I like that. I like that. Then you do it a bit more. It could be a new sport. It could be a hobby. It could be an author. It could be some music. It could be a certain type of food. It could be a product, a car. Oh, I really like that. We like it a bit more. And then we come along and now we love it. And now we're quite telling people about it because, you know, oh, these are the best shoes I've ever had. You know, everybody needs a bag like this bag. We're very, very passionate about this thing. Now, that's quite often where people go. But also in our world, we have these things now called influencers. Now, we've always had influencers, but the modern world, because of social media, lets you know that there are people who, for a living, try to influence you to buy things. That's normal. Not all of that is bad. We have influencers. Now, also in the social media world over here, we have something called blue ticks. Now, if you use any form of social media, you'll notice that there are people out there who are blue tick people. Now, before the blue tick, there were just people in our world that you recognized as trustworthy sources. If he needed one, um, David Attenborough would be a blue tick person. People go, David Attenborough, blue tick. There are people out there we know um, who we see as ambassadors for things. They are quite marked is another way we would have um, we would have referred to it in the past. Or they are people of clear and powerful reputation. So there's the scale. OK, this side of the seesaw from neutral through to wow, really sold out um, right at the end of the scale. That seesaw image. As I guess most of you have been on a seesaw, you know that one of the things that, that's better with a seesaw is if you're using it with somebody who weighs about the same as you. Because if they weigh a lot less than you, they end up in the air and you're stuck on the floor. And if you weigh um, less than them, you end up in the air and they stay up on the floor. We know that, don't we? Similar weights make it more fun. This is what kids do. They bounce up and down. I mean, I used to like seesawing when I was a kid. It was one of the things you go up, you go down, you enjoy the pushing, the lifting. Maybe if you go a bit crazy, you push hard and the other person bounces and it's fun and it's enjoyable. Has anybody ever done that sort of seesawing? Can I just get a show of hands? Have you seesawed? Good, that's good. Keep, keep your hand up if you've tried that where um, you're both standing up. No? Oh, yeah, yeah. There isn't such a thing as an extreme seesawers group, but there is a version of seesawing where what you do is you decide to stand up and down and go do that. And it's so stupid and it's so dangerous. And Andrew's looking at me and I remember doing this. Um, you know, back before playgrounds had rubberized mats and stuff. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just a good job, really. God is good. So I didn't smash my head open, um, nor did you, by the sounds of it. If you take your passions to the extreme, then you could become this person who influences, who speaks on behalf of things. You're blue ticked. You're quite marked. You're a crazy person that stands up and on the end of a seesaw and bounces up and down with another equally crazy person because you do need consent really don't you to do that you can't just decide to do that with your mum otherwise you'll be in trouble um i want to suggest to you that paul is challenging the corinthians calling them to be the word ambassador emissary and that that level of commitment that Paul wants the Corinthians to have is very, very full on. It is all the way at the end of that seesaw. It is basically almost standing up, going crazy, doing something pretty powerful, which has some danger to it. Now think about that. 
The Bible says you can't be Switzerland about the gospel. You're either with God or you're against God. There is no neutral ground. There isn't. You are with the Lord or you are against the Lord. You are saved or you are not yet saved. So if you're a saved person, I think we have times in our lives when we end up sitting quite close to the middle. Yeah, I like God, but I'm not going to tell anybody about God. Yeah, I like church. I'll go a little bit. Yeah, I like God. I'll sing a song if I like that song. There's lots of ways in which we think we have this ability to decide how invested we are in the gospel. But Paul doesn't recognize that type of faith. In fact, he says, you're an ambassador or you've fallen asleep and your faith has gone away. He's very black and white about it. Very black and white about it in this passage. I want to hold, hold on to that thought with you for a second. Um, earlier this year, I said to the deacons, we were going to do some, some study together, um, do some reading together and learn from a Christian um, who's written a book about something. I didn't know what it was. And gratefully, because of um, his daily devotions, Simon suggested a book by Charles Swindle. And we started it this, this week. So in one of our monthly meetings, we're just going to look at a piece, read it, reflect on it, see what it says to us, see how it challenges us. Um, the book is called Improving Your Serve, um, The Art of Unselfish Living. Now, I'm really so glad this came up in Simon's devotion because the first chapter that we read, or chapter two, was really eye-opening. It was really good. And I'm praying that we'll get a lot out of it. In fact, I want to commend this book to you and say, if you can buy this book by Charles Swindle and have a read of it and um, or find a podcast, the audio book, because not everybody likes to read and struggles with reading. Um, and if you can't afford the book, tell me. And, and I haven't asked, said this to James yet, but the church will buy you the book. It's £10. No, seriously, if you want to read it and you can't afford the book, um, say something and we'll get you a copy. Now, I would say buy the cheap ones on the marketplace, but there aren't any more anymore because I've checked. But £10 is not bad. Anyway, there was something in this book this week in our first discussion, which I thought was a really relevant quote for Paul's argument about being ambassadors for the gospel, being all in in our faith, being alive to recognize that what we're doing is as christians is basically the equivalent of standing up and down on the end of a seesaw going god is amazing god is alive and what jesus did is everything now in 1971 a pastor wilbur reese he wrote a book um and it was called three dollars worth of god and his reflection was that three dollars was about as much of God as many Christians actually wanted in their lives. And this is what he said. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a warm cup of milk or a nice snooze in the sunshine. I don't want too much i don't want enough of god that will make me love a black man or make me want to pick beats with a migrant i want ecstasy but not transformation i want the warmth of the womb but not the pain of new birth i want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack i would like to buy three dollars worth of god please I want to suggest, if we're looking at this seesaw, that $3 worth of God is about an inch to the right of neutral. I'm not going to suggest how many dollars, we don't even use dollars, do we? How much of God it is to be at the end of the scale where Paul expects Christians to be. 
but it is a lot more than $3. Paul's contention is this. It doesn't matter who brought you to the gospel. It doesn't matter how you came into the gospel, but what matters is we keep preaching it and we keep living it out, which is that we have faith in it, that we are its ambassadors, assuming, as verse 2 says, that our faith hasn't come to nothing. Because as I said, Paul is like, you're an ambassador or nothing. That's how strong he is on this. So let me ask you this question. How much of God do you want? You know what? If you're in a place where you feel, then you've, you've only got $3 worth of God at the moment, then I want to suggest that's not going to last. That wouldn't be a good budget to keep you alive anyway, and spiritually it isn't. Paul is very clear. I'm going to be a bit more gentle. And if you don't want to be more gentle with me, then be clear with Paul. I believe that Paul understood that many of the Christians in Corinth struggled. And he expected that all of them, if they were alive to Christ, were on the road to being all the way in as ambassadors. That they, he expected that they knew that $3 was not going to see them through to the judgment day. Now look, that image of, well, we'll say it's me and Andrew going up and down, standing up on the seesaw because he's crazy enough to admit to it too. Um, I get that that's a scary image. The idea of standing up and standing out in your streets, in workplaces, in homes for God, that is scary. But when we live for God, fully in, fully exposed, fully upright, fully out there, we don't do it in our own strength. This seesaw thing was perhaps one of the silly things I used to do as a child. I remember wading down rivers um, to my chest, barefoot, collecting golf balls. I remember jumping off swings at the top of the swing. Some of you, have, you know, when you used to do the swing, and some of us used to jump off at the top and try not to break our everything. I remember demolishing a, uh, an old toilet block building with my friends one day because it was condemned and we knocked it down. And we didn't have stunt doubles. We didn't have safety ropes. Uh, when we're kids, we don't often think. And we do lots of crazy things. And you've done them too. When we're ambassadors for God, being upright, being bold and being counted is challenging. But God says we're never alone. God's spirit will give us the words he promises. God even promises to protect us because sometimes when we stand up for him and we speak the truth in love to our world, it does come with a cost. You know, John says in his gospel that uh, not only will he be with us, but those that who come to him will never be taken away. Nobody can take us away from him as we trust. Nothing can break his grip on us. I'm going to finish, but I just want to say this. If you're sitting there with $3 worth of God or $4 worth of God or $10 worth of God and you think, I want more, but I'm scared, I'm worried, or I don't know if, if what that will mean, if you recognize that you're not as invested on God or focused on God or as dedicated to God or as vocal about God as you should be, then let's do something simple about it. Not where we make pinky promises to one another, but where we speak to God and we say, you know what, God? Sometimes I do settle for $3 worth of you and I don't want to. I don't get it right. I want to be far more positive about you and my day to day than I am. And it doesn't matter if you say that and you're only positive once out of 10 times. You know what? We need to embrace failure a lot more. Sometimes the fear of failure stops Christians from trying. What happens if we tell someone about Jesus and they swear at us? Jesus would have smiled at them and said, God loved them. Whereas quite often we're so afraid of failure, we don't even try. Or we've been told to get lost or worse. Things you can't say when you're being recorded. Um, so we just don't. 
the fear of failure stops us. But actually, failure is a good lesson for us. It teaches us perseverance. It teaches us to keep trying. You know, Jesus' mission and his disciples' mission would have not gone far if he'd have gone, well, some people don't want this, so I'm going to stop. If you feel like you're too close to neutral, if you feel like you're struggling with a lack of passion, if you feel like you want to know more of God, then I'm going to pray in a minute. And you're all going to pray too. Uh, we're going to have our eyes closed. Nobody's going to be looking at nothing or no one. Uh, not even me. I'm going to pray. And when I pray, if you feel like you actually want to get past the $3 line and get a bit closer, then this is the simple challenge that I've got for you. If you're not able to stand up, you just put your arm up. If you're worried that people will hear you standing up, you just put your arm up. If you're willing, when I'm praying, stand up. Stand up with me. And we're going to pray and we're going to say, you know what, God? Some days I'm just giving you $3 and that's just not good enough. I want to give you more. I'm trusting your spirit to come in so I can give you more. It's simple. And if that's not what you think, if you're so far off the end, that's, that's wonderful. But don't be that close to neutral because it isn't going to last. It doesn't last. So let's, let's pray. Let's just be quiet and still before God. And I'll invite you to stand if you want in a minute while I'm praying or put your arm up. But let's talk to God. Dear Lord Jesus, in that song, See What a Morning, we recognize and remember what you did. We recognize and remember your resurrection, the truth that you're enthroned with the Father. We recognize that everything we have is because of you and everything we are with you is wonderful. Lord, we know our lives aren't always easy. We know, Lord, at times we've let you down. And Lord, for the fact that we let you down on a daily basis, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness right now. Lord, I want to Thank you. I want to thank you that when we say, Lord, forgive us, we're not like a, a, an angry parent. You're not like an angry parent who holds it against us. You remember it no more. So if we say, Lord, forgive me, and we mean it in our hearts, and you know, you know what we, we mean for real, God. Sometimes what we say isn't what we mean. But you know it. And I pray, Lord, that we would know that we're forgiven. And especially in this area of being ambassadors for you, Lord, some of us talk about you as if we're ambassadors, but we just like you. We're nowhere near where we should be. And Lord, as I said a minute ago, if people want to recognize that they want more of you, I just ask them to stand up now or raise a hand now as I continue to pray. Lord, I do pray that you would see us in our hearts, Lord, and for those of us who are saying, Lord, we need more of you. We need more of your power, more of your grace, more of your wisdom. We need more of your rule, Lord. We're not happy with $3 of you because we know it won't last. Lord, I pray that you would hear our act and heart of faith and you would draw nearer to us. You would help us to move far away from Switzerland to the point where we're standing up and standing out loud for you and our words and our actions are in tune with your spirit and your word lord i do pray lord for a spurt of faith and a growth of love through our trust in you lord i pray against faith that comes to nothing Lord, I pray against a grey, boring church, Lord. We pray for a church that changes this town, this area, this um, district, this borough, this London in denial, whatever it is that we are around here, Lord. We pray, Lord, that your passion would come up in us and it would be like the spring of water that overflows and leads to eternal life. Lord, hear our prayers. If anybody's standing up and you want to sit down, now is the time to just to sit down. Hear our prayers, Lord. 
and receive our plea for growth in our hearts. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing two songs. Um, do you want to tell the children where, where they can come back? <laughs>